GLC presents Brought to you by the donations of our faithful partners Shalom I'm Eddie Chumney of Hebraic Heritage Ministries and we welcome you today to our study on the Hebraic roots of Christianity. We are doing a series entitled Yeshua from Genesis to Revelation. And this is going to be program number 16 in the series. And in this program, we are going to look at the book of 1 Peter and we're going to show how this is written to the northern kingdom. Now, when we're studying the Hebraic roots of Christianity, we must remember to keep everything centered on Yeshua the Messiah because we're told in Psalm in chapter 40 and verse 7, Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me. This is quoted in Hebrews in chapter 10 and verse 7 referring to Yeshua the Messiah that in the volume of the book in the totality of Scripture it is written of him Yeshua himself told us of this in Luke in chapter 24 in verse 27 it says, in beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Then in verse 44, and he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the Torah of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. So Yeshua said that the Torah, the prophets, and the Psalms spoke or is written of him. So we are doing this study, Yeshua, from Genesis to Revelation to see how Scripture speaks of him. Yeshua is in the Torah. Yeshua created the heavens and the earth. John chapter 1 verse 3, Colossians chapter 1 verses 15 and 16. Yeshua made covenant with Abraham, Galatians chapter 3 and verse 16. Yeshua led the children of Israel out of Egypt. He was the rock that was in the wilderness. 1 Corinthians in chapter 10 verses 1 through 4. Yeshua is the right hand that defeated Pharaoh and his army in the Red Sea. Exodus chapter 15 and verse 6. Yeshua is the lawgiver that saves, James chapter 4 and verse 12. And at Mount Sinai there was a marriage that was made between Yeshua, the lawgiver and the bridegroom, and the house of Jacob, who is his bride. But the house of Jacob broke the covenant, and they were exiled in the nations of the world. And all the prophets prophesied that they would be regathered. And the one who would regather them, Jeremiah chapter 23, Ezekiel chapter 34, is the Messiah of Israel. So Yeshua dies on the tree, John chapter 10, verses 16 and 17, John chapter 11, verses 49 through 52, for the purpose of forgiving the sins of the house of Jacob, his bride or his wife, and then ultimately setting things up so that there can be an ultimate physical regathering of the 12 tribes of Israel. Because this was seen to be a role in the task of the Messiah, Yeshua was asked in Acts in chapter 1 in verse 6, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? So his answer is in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, I'm going to empower you and you will be my witnesses of the restoration of the kingdom to Israel in Jerusalem and in Judea. Jerusalem and Judea is associated with the house of Judah or the Jewish people, then in Samaria. Samaria is a reference to the northern kingdom and then to the uttermost parts of the earth because the 12 tribes were scattered to the ends of the earth and the ends of the earth is where 
all those from the nations are going to hear the good news of Messiah as this message is being proclaimed. So we have in Acts chapter 2, outpouring of the Holy Spirit in Jerusalem. And then in Acts in chapter 8, verse 1, the message was spread to Judea and Samaria. And then with the calling of Paul, his commissioning was to go to the quote-unquote ends of the earth, or specifically his commissioning was to go to the non-Jews. And what we're going to see from his writings that Paul understood that when he traveled and wrote his epistles and spoke of Messiah, he knew that he was communicating with the exiles of Israel. He was proclaiming that Yeshua is the Messiah, a return to the Torah, and that Yeshua unites the 12 tribes of Israel. Paul taught the uniting of the 12 tribes of Israel in his ministry as he himself testified before King Agrippa in Acts in chapter 26 in verse 6 and 7 as he stated and now I stand am and judged for the hope of the promise made of God unto our fathers unto which promise our 12 tribes instantly serving God day and night hope to come. Paul said that he was being judged or accused for proclaiming the hope of the promise that God made to the fathers. And this promise is a promise that our 12 tribes who are serving God day and night, a promise that they hope to come, which means it hasn't happened yet. What is this promise? That there would be the end of the exile, that the 12 tribes would return to the land, they would no more be oppressed by their enemies, and Messiah would rule and reign over them, they would be following the Messiah, and Israel would be the head of all nations. When is the ultimate fulfillment of these things? The ultimate fulfillment of these things is associated with the Messianic era. When Yeshua sets his feet down the Mount of Olives, and he sets up his kingdom. So, the picture that we are painting for you in these series of teachings is that the central theme of the New Testament is the role of the Messiah to unite the 12 tribes of Israel and a detailed explanation of how it's going to happen. What is that detailed explanation? That Yeshua is going to die on the tree to forgive the sins and then ultimately to unite the 12 tribes of Israel. John chapter 10, verses 16 and 17. John chapter 11, verses 49 through 52. That in his ministry, he's going to train up disciples. And he said in them, follow me, Mark chapter 1, verse 17, and I will make you fishers of men. Because there is a prophecy in Jeremiah chapter 16, verses 14 through 16, where specifically in Jeremiah 16, verse 16, it says that fishers would be sent to the exiles of Israel. So the disciples were raised up, and among the disciples there were literal fishermen, and Yeshua commissioned them and sent them out into the nations of the world. And we can see that in order to proclaim Messiah, the repentance of sin, return to Torah, and the uniting of the 12 tribes of Israel, it would take the empowering of the Holy Spirit of God to do that. And that's why we find in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, Messiah said that he is going to pour out his spirit so that his sent ones can be witnesses of this message. And 
the New Testament puts great emphasis on then the calling of Paul. And Paul, in Acts, in chapter 13, in verse 46, understood that his calling was based upon prophecies from Isaiah chapter 49. Because in Acts chapter 13, verse 46, Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, but seeing you put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, for lo, we turn to the Gentiles. And then he says, For so has God commanded us, saying, I have set you to be a light to the Gentiles, that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. He's quoting from Isaiah in chapter 49 and verse 6. Well, in order to understand the context of Isaiah chapter 49, um, let's see what verse 6 is talking about. It says that, it's a light thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved of Israel. The subject of the verse is the uniting of the twelve tribes of Israel. It says, I will give you to be a light to the Gentiles that you, may, that you may be my salvation to the ends of the earth. So being a light to the Gentiles is in the context of that you are my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved of Israel. Paul referred to this verse as his calling, his biblical calling. That's why he proclaimed in Acts chapter 26 and verses 6 and 7 and that he was not only proclaiming Yeshua as the Messiah, but he was proclaiming the restoration of the 12 tribes of Israel. So we are going to look in greater detail to see how the New Testament is written to the exiles of Israel. And we're going to look at the book of 1 Peter and we're going to see how this book is written to the northern kingdom in exile. But in order to see the connection, we have to understand Hosea in chapter 1. The book of Hosea was written to the northern kingdom and it specified of their judgment for breaking the covenant and the mercy that would be shown to them and their restoration and ultimate as we're told in Hosea 1.11 their reunification with the house of Judah. So Hosea's marriage to Gomer is going to represent the whoredom that was committed by the northern kingdom. It says, The beginning of the word of the Lord by Hosea, and the Lord said to Hosea, Go take you a wife of whoredom and children of whoredom, for the land has committed great whoredom in departing from the Lord. So there are three children that are mentioned as a result of this marriage. And the names of the three children are going to be prophetic of the judgment upon the northern kingdom and their spiritual status. The first one in Hosea, in chapter 1 and verse 4, the first child is named Jezreel. And Jezreel means God will sow or God will scatter. That the northern kingdom is going to be scattered or assimilated into the nations of the world. And then the second child, Hosea chapter 1 verse 6, is named Lo Ruhama. Lo in Hebrew means not, and Ruhama means mercy. The second child is named No Mercy. The third child is in Hosea in chapter 1 in verse 9, and the name of the child is Lo Ami. Lo in Hebrew is not Am, in Hebrew is people, Ami is my people. So the third child is named Not My People. So I'm going to scatter you in the nations of the world, Jezreel. I'm not going to show you mercy, and you're not going to be my people. That, my friends, is not good news. But there's a pattern when the God of Israel gives judgment through his prophets. He always ends words of condemnation or words of judgment with words of comfort or encouragement. 
And this is how this chapter ends in Hosea chapter 1 verse 10. Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea which cannot be measured or numbered. And it will come to pass in the place where it was said, you are not my people. There it will be said, you are the sons of the living God. It's a prophecy that they would go from being not his people to being a son of the living God. Well, who is a son of the living God? John in chapter 1 and verse 12 says, But as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So this is a prophecy that those of the northern kingdom are going to become believers in Yeshua as the Messiah. First, they'll become believers in Yeshua as Messiah, and then secondly, we, we will see their unification with the house of Judah. Hosea chapter 1 verse 11. Then the children of Judah will be gathered together and appoint themselves one head. So after your sons of the living God, then the children of Judah and the children of Israel will be gathered together. That's the unification of the 12 tribes of Israel and appoint themselves one head. The one head is the Messiah. So we also see uh, the prophecy that was given uh, unto the northern kingdom in Hosea in chapter 2 and verse 23 which says, And I will sow her unto me in the earth, and I will have mercy upon her that had not obtained mercy. And I will say to them which were not my people, you are my people. And they will say, you are my God. Now, with this background in the book of Hosea, now we can go to 1 Peter. In chapter 2 and verse 5, we see that this letter is written to believers in Yeshua as the Messiah. Because it says, you are lively stones, you are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Yeshua HaMashiach. Now the key here, linking Hosea to this letter of 1 Peter, is 1 Peter in chapter 2 and verse 10, where it says, which in time past were not a people. Well, who in time past was not a people? It was the northern kingdom. When were they called not a people? In Hosea, in chapter 1 and verse 9. But you are now the people of God. How did they become the people of God? They believed that Yeshua is Messiah, which had not obtained mercy. When did they not obtain mercy? Back in Hosea chapter 1. Lo Ruhama, no mercy. But now you have obtained mercy. How did they obtain mercy? By believing that Yeshua is the Messiah. So now let's go to 1 Peter in chapter 1 in verse 1 where it says, Peter, an apostle of Yeshua HaMashiach, to the strangers scattered, strangers scattered, verse 2, elect, according to the foreknowledge of God. Well, the word scattered in Greek is diaspora. And the term that Jews use to refer to being in exile they, are, they say that they are in the diaspora. But this is said that these are strangers in the diaspora who are elect. Who in the Bible is referred to as being elect? It is the nation of Israel. And we can see how this is written to the northern kingdom because at the end of 1 Peter... In 1 Peter, in chapter 5, in verse 13, it says, The church at Babylon, well, church that is, is in italics, which means it's not in the original text. What the text says is, The at Babylon, elected together with you, salute you, or say hi. So who is in Babylon that is elected together with someone else? Well, it was the house of Judah or the Jewish people that got taken to Babylon. And the house of Judah or the Jewish people are elected together with their brothers of the northern kingdom. So 
this letter is being written to the strangers scattered who are elect. And then it says, those in Babylon elected together with you salute you or say hi. So we can see here that first Peter is written to the northern kingdom because it is the nation of Israel who is referred to as being elect. Isaiah in chapter 45 and verse 4 we can see how that the nation of Israel is called elect. For Jacob my servant's sake and Israel my elect. It says in 1 Peter in chapter 2 and verse 9. But you are a chosen generation. Well, who in the Bible is chosen? It is the nation of Israel. Deuteronomy in chapter 7 and verse 6 says, You are a holy people under the Lord your God, and the Lord your God has chosen you to be a special people unto himself above all people that are upon the face of the earth. Now if we look at 1 Peter in chapter 1 in verse 10, it says, Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently who prophesied of the grace that would come to you. The prophets prophesied of the grace that would come to the strangers who are scattered and elect. Well, where do we see that the prophets prophesied that grace or mercy would come upon the northern kingdom? In Jeremiah, in chapter 31... And verse 30, Jeremiah chapter 31 and verse 20, it says, Is Ephraim my dear son? And then it says at the end of verse 20, I will surely have mercy upon him. So Jeremiah wrote of the mercy that would be shown to Ephraim. And then we read earlier from Hosea in chapter 2, and verse 23, the following, I will sow her unto me in the earth. I will have mercy upon her that had not obtained mercy. I will say to them which were not my people, you are my people. And then we're going to look at 1 Peter in chapter 1 and verse 18, which says, for as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers. You are not redeemed by and through tradition received of your fathers. What's this referring to? The tradition of the fathers is a reference to the rabbinic Jewish oral law. He says, you are not saved or redeemed through the oral law, but, verse 19, but by the precious blood of Yeshua. And now, let's look at 1 Peter in chapter 2 in verse 25. It says, you were as sheep going astray, but you've returned to the shepherd and bishop of your soul. Do you realize you can't return unless you originally was with somebody? You were as sheep going astray. How were they as sheep going astray? They broke the covenant at Mount Sinai, and then they went into exile, and being in exile, they were scattered into the nations of the world, sheep going astray. But you've returned to the shepherd. You return to the one that you originally made covenant with at Mount Sinai, showing that the shepherd was the one that made the covenant at Mount Sinai. James chapter 4 verse 12, there is one lawgiver that is able to save. So in this session we've looked at 1 Peter and we saw how it is written to the northern kingdom in exile. It's written to the strangers scattered who are elect. 
and we cross-referenced this was 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 13 that those in Babylon who are elected say hi or salute or greet you. So we see the strangers scattered that are elect would be the northern kingdom. 1 Peter chapter 2 verses 10 and 11 speaking to the audience that is receiving this letter they are referred to as previously not being a people not being shown mercy that was said of the northern kingdom and then in first Peter chapter 1 verse 10 it says the prophets prophesied of the grace that would come to you that grace is is prophesied of Ephraim in Jeremiah chapter 31 verse 20 and also in Hosea chapter 2 verse 23 but now you have return to the shepherd and the bishop of your soul. They're returning. They originally was, but now they're returning. So we can see this letter of 1 Peter was written to the northern kingdom in exile. Well, remember always these words from 1 John in chapter 2 and verse 6. He that says he abides in him, he that says He's a believer in Yeshua as the Messiah, ought himself to walk, that is to live our lives, even as he walked. And how did Yeshua walk, or how did he live his life? He followed the Torah, even as he commanded those who believe in him, in John chapter 14, verse 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. Shalom in Yeshua the Messiah. Amen.